Thank you. Um, thank you very much to the conference organisers for uh, inviting me here to talk today. And I'd also like to thank uh, two of the previous speakers in particular, um, Henrik and Charles, because I think they've set up quite nicely um, what I want to talk about in this presentation. So I think I win the award for the longest distance travelled to be at this conference today. Uh, I'm from Australia. Uh, not only from Australia, I'm from the bottom bit of Australia. So it was a very long flight, um, but it's wonderful to be here in such a wonderful wonderful city. So I'm here to talk a little bit more about learning analytics, which Henrik has quite nicely set up for me. But in particular, I'd really like to focus in on the idea around feedback. So as educators, uh, we're very, well, hopefully, we're all very uh, aware of the value of feedback and, uh, and what it can do for both us as teachers, understanding how effective our, learn our teaching has been, but also for students in, uh, in understanding how effective their learning has been. So, what I want to do, and my reference to Charles's speech earlier, was that he talked about learning analytics and big data being something that was quite interesting, but we want to talk about it at the level of the teacher. And in my talk, I want to talk about it both at the level of the teacher and the level of the student. So this is the definition of learning analytics, and as I said, Henrik set it up quite ni nicely for us uh, today as it is. But this is the, uh, the definition from the Society of Learning Analytics Research. And the idea here is that it's about measurement, it's about analysis and collection and all those sorts of things, but it's really about learners and their contexts. And context was another key word that um, Henrik used a lot at the end of his talk today, uh, to say how important context is in doing anything to do with learning analytics. So how do we interpret analytics? How do we measure analytics? How do we uh, represent analytics and the visualizations that we use? So that's one of the key things that I take out of this definition. But the other is about optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. So we want to know what can we do to make the teaching and learning experience better for teachers and for learners. So I'm really um, quite Happy to see that there's a really broad uh, audience here today of educators from all different levels of, of education. And whilst what I'm going to talk about is mainly research that we do in higher education at universities, I hope that it will be applicable to you in your own environments as well, whether it be in a, in a primary school environment, secondary school, and so on. So. A few years ago, um, George Siemens and Philip Long came up with this idea of trying to kind of, kind of classify the different types of analytics that you can have, right from the idea of academic analytics and that sort of management, um, either at a national level or an institutional level, and looking at you know how do we um, give, how do we distribute resources, all of the different things around student retention, and that's where a lot of the uh, emphasis in learning analytics was early on in the piece very much around the idea of retention. How do we stop students from dropping out or failing? And that's really important. And please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that isn't important. But at the University of Melbourne, we decided to take a slightly different tact. And partly that was because we don't have much of a retention problem. We actually don't have a lot of students who drop out, which is a wonderful thing to have. But what it meant was we didn't need learning analytics to, do, to stop students from dropping out or to identify those students. Um, we thought, well, what can we do with these analytics that are going to be more effective for us in our particular context at the University of Melbourne? So what we've been doing in our research is really focusing in, oh sorry, and also as Henrik said, there was the micro, the meso and the macro levels of, uh, of detail in looking at learning analytics. So we've really focused in on the micro level. So that level of teaching and learning in the classroom or in the online activity that's really about single learning activities or learning tasks within a curriculum. And what you'll see today is I'll be presenting two different projects that we've been doing. As I said, one that looks at the teachers and one that looks at the students. The student one is not so much um, the state of the play now. It's trying to learn about how we might use learning analytics into the future. But the teaching one is certainly looking at teachers in higher education, or it could be in any kind of education really, and how they want to use learning analytics and how they can use learning analytics to help them to improve their teaching and to improve their students' learning. So um, I actually didn't know Henrik was going to be here when I first started to put these slides together, so I quoted some of his own research. Um, but he put together a paper a few years ago looking at the different ways that we can use academic analytics and also learning analytics. And so I picked out sort of my, my top four that I thought from his list in terms of the things that we can do with learning analytics. And these are the ideas around personalising learning, 
understanding more about learning. What, what do we know about how students learn, the processes that they use, the study techniques that they adopt? Um, the pedagogical and assessment improvements. I think there's an awful lot that we can do here around how we design our, t our teaching and learning tasks for students, but a huge amount can be done with assessment. And I think that that's something that uh, one of the speakers will talk about a little bit later on today in terms of assessment, but I think there's a lot of scope there. And understanding student motivation and attitude is another thing that is quite useful and quite uh, beneficial to how we teach and how we design our teaching and learning. So, as I said, at the University of Melbourne we had two main bits of research that we wanted to focus in on. So we knew that there was this huge amount of data that students were um, generating in by using e-learning systems. So learning management systems or virtual learning environments, um, other types of learning systems, systems that just have data about students' demographics, their backgrounds, their previous uh, academic achievement scores, those sorts of things. But we thought, okay, there's all this data, it exists, it's in lots of different systems, you know, and even if we were able to bring it together all in one system, what do we want this, what do we want to do with this data? What sort of questions do we have that we want answered by this data? And in particular, what does this data need to look like to be useful and meaningful to teachers. So it's great that we talk about big data, it's great that we talk about analytics, but unless we can put something into the hands of teachers that they can understand and interpret, then it, we're sort of wasting our time, I guess. And the other thing, the other key element that a lot of people don't really consider in this whole equation is when. What is the time that this data is most useful to teachers? When is it? Is it just at the beginning of semester? Is it just at the end of the year? Is it something that should be continuously de delivered to staff as, or to teachers as we go through? Is it something that needs to be in real time or is it something that they can have a little bit of a lag behind? So we had lots of questions about how does this actually work in practice? What do we do to make this stuff work in the classroom? And of course, the other thing we're interested in, so that's the teaching side of it, is the student side. So how do we give that data back to students and how do we do it in a way that will help them in their learning? So there's still questions there about how do we represent this data? How do we put it into pictures or words or numbers in a way that will be meaningful to them? And also, when do we give this data to them? Is this something that we give them throughout the semester? At the moment, we give most of them their data at the end of semester. We give them their final results and send them on their way. So is there a way that we can use this data in a more meaningful and timely manner to be able to give students the feedback that they need to improve their learning? So let's start with the teachers. We did two studies in particular. The first study was in 2013 and we did nine focus groups with uh, different groups across our institution, so just at a single uh, institution, the University of Melbourne. Now, Melbourne is not the largest university in Australia. It has um, around 40,000 students, around 10,000 staff. It's, it's quite a big university. It's ranked number one in Australia. Um, and, but it has a very traditional approach to teaching and learning. Being the second oldest university in Australia after the University of Sydney, it, um, it's been around for a long time. We have very old buildings and we tend to have very old teaching and learning methods as well. So we do have technology in our teaching, but not as much as we see in some other universities. So this has been a bit of a challenge for us in terms of learning analytics, because how do we collect data about students' use of online technologies when they're not using online technologies? So there's been, but we thought it's still an interesting question to go out to ask the teachers about, okay, if they could collect more of this data and if we did have more access to these, this sort of information, how can we use this to improve teaching and learning at the university? So that was the first study that we did. And I'll tell you the results of that in a moment. But just to tell you a little bit more about the second study. In the second study, we asked 12 individual academics the similar sorts of questions around, in your teaching and learning practice, what kind of data or what kind of issues and problems do you have that you think that data could be useful for? So what sort of tasks do you ask your students to do? And what data would help uh, you to monitor those tasks, to improve those tasks, or to help with the students' learning within those tasks. Um, this study, we didn't just do at the University of Melbourne, we also did at the University of South Australia, which is in Adelaide, and also Macquarie University, which is in Sydney. So, what did the, student, or what did the teachers say? 
In the focus groups, the main thing that teachers talked about was student engagement. How do I know that the students are engaging with my activities, with my resources, with the things that we're asking them to do online? Are they logging in to our learning management system? Are they reading the notes before the lectures? All of those sorts of things. And of course, they also were very interested in how the students were performing. So what were the assessment results? Um, and certainly that question of, at-risk students to some extent, you know, which of my students are struggling, which students do I need to spend more time with. Um, attendance was a big one. They really wanted to know who was turning up to their classes. Now that's great, only we don't collect that information. So it's really hard to analyse it because it doesn't exist. Uh, but it was certainly something that was really important to a lot of academics at the University of Melbourne in particular. So as I said before about accessing learning resources was, was a key uh, finding there as well. They wanted to know about participation in communication. Which students were uh, being part of the discussions online and which students were not being part of those discussions. And then, as I said before, about performance in assessment. How well were the students doing? Were there any trends across the semester in terms of their performance in assessment? Uh, were, were some students doing better in certain assessments and not others? All of these sorts of questions in particular. But really, what came through was they wanted to know what was the ideal pattern of engagement that led to a really great student performance. In other words, they wanted to know, how do I make the ideal student? How do I make a student who can perform really, really well? What do they need to do? How many times do they need to log in? How many times do they have to look at certain resources? Now, we know that that formula doesn't exist. We know that there isn't an answer to that question. But it was certainly something that the academics were quite interested in learning more about. So. But one of the main things that came through was the idea of feedback. How can I look at the data that I'm getting from what my students are doing in their online tasks and use that to give the students feedback on what they should be doing about their learning? There was also a couple of other things that came through around the learning experience, so really getting to the nuts and bolts of what is learning, how are students learning, what strategies are they using. There were some questions about using analytics to measure the quality of teaching and learning. So being able to look at different cohorts across time, was performance increasing, was it decreasing, uh, were there issues around uh, design and quality of teaching. But most surprisingly, and one of the most common ones that we saw, was around the administrative functions to do with teaching and learning. So they weren't, there was a lot of, uh, of the people that we spoke to in these focus groups who were saying, look, I already know what my students are doing. I see them in the classroom. I know what their results are. I mark their tests. But what I really need is a system that lets me look at analytics around which tutorial groups are they in and how do I look at those students who have met um, safety requirements before they go on you know, um, excursions or into lab-based environments, things like that. So it was interesting because it's the sort of learning analytics that we don't really think about, but it's certainly um, things that are quite important to teachers because it helps them in their job and it helps to make their life a little bit easier. So moving on to the interviews, as I said, we did 12 interviews with people from three different universities in Australia. But what we were quite surprised about was we saw a lot of the same sorts of themes coming through that came through in the focus groups around student engagement and performance and all of those sorts of things. But really, their ideas and their requests were very basic. We thought people would be wanting to do these amazing analytics with these wonderful, complex visualisations, very sophisticated type stuff. But actually, the teachers were saying, look, just give me some basic stuff. I can't really even get to the basic stuff at the moment. If you can at least give me some of the really basic statistics, that'll give me something, a foundation to start with, and then we can build up from there. So we were quite surprised, because we'd actually had funding for this, and we wanted to build a tool. And so we wanted people to come up with some really great ideas. And yet they said, no, no, we're not really interested in all this really fancy stuff yet. We just want some of the basics. There was a focus on engagement analytics. So a lot of people, when do my students log in? Have they looked at this resource? How many times have they looked at this resource? That kind of thing. But one of the things that we found, and as I alluded to a little bit earlier, is that there's still a fairly limited use of technology in education. So we do use it in lots of different ways, but we do tend to, certainly at our university, we tend to teach in a blended format. So there's a lot of stuff that happens in the classroom, face to face, for which no data exists. And that's fine, you know, that's, that's also good education. 
Um, but what it means is that it makes these huge gaps in what you want to know about how students progress. So if you're teaching something fully online, that's fabulous. You've got a data trail that takes you from week one of semester through to the end and you can see everything that the student has done in the online environment. But even then, you still can't see what they've done outside the online environment. You can't see that informal learning that often happens and the other tools and technologies that they may use to support their teaching, uh, their learning strategies that are not university supported. So we, th we found there were a lot of challenges around this idea of, well, technology is only used for some things, but not everything. And there were concerns, and again, um, Henry alluded to this a little bit earlier around the competencies. Um, a lot of academics were saying, well, you know, if you give me this data, that'd be lovely, but I don't know that I'm going to be able to understand it. You know, I'm not really good at statistics. It's a long time since I studied maths. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to understand exactly what you're talking about here. So anyway, these were some of the key themes that came up from this. Because one of the things that people often ask for is something that looks like this. I want to know when my students are logging in. So here's a graph, seven days, Sunday through to Saturday, and we can see when the students are logging in. That's nice. What does it mean? Okay, and this is the question. We get a lot of people saying, oh, tell me when, tell me when. Well, is when important? Is when important to the design of whatever the teaching and learning activity is? So, and people sort of then think, oh, yeah, okay, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if my students are logging in and doing their homework at three o'clock in the morning, I don't really care. They can do it any time, just as long as I know they've done it. So we wanted to move beyond these kinds of basic representations of data and get the, the teachers to really think about the context of their teaching and learning design. And so that brought us to the idea of learning design. Now, learning design is something that, you know, it's been around forever. We've been calling it learning design for probably the last 20 years. But it's the idea of really thinking about what are we asking our students to do and putting this down on paper in a way that is meaningful and that we can share with one another. So the idea of sort of thinking through all the different elements of a learning design. So a lot of you in, uh, in K-12 to education will talk about these things in terms of lesson plans. And there can be lesson plans for face-to-face -face learning as much as there can be lesson plans for online learning. But the idea behind learning design is really powerful in the context of learning analytics because it really gives you a structure for analytics to, to work with, so a semantic structure, as, uh, as these guys said in 2015. But also, um, Laurie Lockyer and uh, Liz Heathcote and Shane Dawson, who are also Australians, um, they talk about it in terms of documenting pedagogical intent. And we like this idea of pedagogical intent. What is it that you want your students to do? What is it you want them to learn? And then let's have a look and see how the analytics can help us to see whether or not the patterns that you expected are the patterns that students are actually following. So we've come up with a, a conceptual framework, and I won't go into this in a great lot of detail in the time we have, but uh, this is something that we've been working on with some people across, across the world, actually, with people from Edinburgh, um, a number of different institutions in Australia, to try and think about, well, how do we look at the different types of learning analytics? And Henrik showed you a number of different uh, ways that learning analytics can be used this morning. Um, but how can we look at those types of analytics, and then how do we add the context to that and then work out what our support tools will be. But what you'll notice is that, and coming back to what Charles said, the teacher, oh, sorry, got me back. Ah, oh, dear me, I've gone back too far. There we go, the teacher, there we go. The teacher is quite central. We need the teacher. The teacher is the person who has designed the learning in the first place. The teacher is the person who knows what the students are doing and, and has that interaction with the students. And they are the way that we can interpret the way the data that's coming out and then obviously feed that back through to the, teach, uh, to, to the students. So the teacher is key and I think the teacher is really important when we talk about learning analytics. A lot of this thing, these things that we want to talk about, machine learning and you know, students just interacting with computers, the teacher still has a key role in the design and also in the interpretation of this sort of data. So we've developed a tool. It's a very basic tool at the moment. It's just our first go at it. But we wanted to try and see if there was some way that we could take some of this data and give it back to, to academics in a meaningful way. So we've given them some of the basic graphs that they wanted, some of the, uh, the basic analytics uh, that we wanted. But we didn't want to just give them numbers. We didn't just want to say, right, on Mondays the students logged in 10 times and that sort of thing. We wanted to give them this data in relation to key instructional events. So if you have a look here on the 
the graph. Um, we look at the, the lecture. So let's see, here we go. The lecture is our key instructional event here. So we can look at this was the usage leading up to the lecture, and then this is the usage after the lecture. And that gives more context and more meaning. Now again, that might be a perfectly fine pattern. You've seen that most students have engaged prior to the instructional event, and then it's fallen off afterwards, mainly because they've probably moved on to the next thing, which is fine. But there are lots of different visualizations that we've tried to incorporate into this tool. Um, so for a particular piece of content, you can see how this content has been used across a period of time. So it could be that you expected the students to access this once, and yet they've gone back and they've accessed it multiple times. And that will give you a chance to say, okay, I wonder why that is, and maybe talk to your students and find out why they're going back and looking at this material. Is it really complex? Do you need to provide them with a simple way of, uh, of getting into the content in this area? We also have um, graphs that show students' use of resources prior to and after different instructional events. So at the University of Melbourne, we've got a number of academics starting to use the flipped classroom, that idea of giving students something to do prior to the teaching uh, event and then using the teaching event as a really interactive, hands-on type experience. So we want to know how many students are dealing with the material prior to and how many students are not, because it's quite important to know how well prepared the students are for that kind of learning activity. Um, and also we have information about individual students, so we can see which students are engaging with the materials online more or less than others. Now this is great, but as I said, in our particular context, the online component of teaching and learning may only represent a very small amount of what the students actually do. So I think there's a lot more that we need to, to learn about how we can use these sorts of tools in blended learning environments where you have a lot of face-to-face -face and only some online. And what was really interesting in the trials, we've only just been piloting this tool over the last few months. And uh, a lot of the academics said, it's really nice. Um, you know, looks nice, We've, we're getting some interesting uh, patterns emerging and we were able to follow that up with our students. But uh, it's really great that I can download the data and run my own analysis in different ways. So we spent a lot of time, effort and money uh, creating visualizations which they only partly use. Um, but I think that's interesting in a sense because it's telling us that maybe what we've designed hasn't quite met their needs and we, I'd really like to be able to sort of follow up on this study and find out well what are some of those extra analyses. Now at the moment it's very much a here's the picture of, um, of time over the semester, engagement, performance, that sort of thing. And when we spoke to some of our pilot um, participants they said well look I really need to be able to put these data together more. I need to be able to say right for the students who looked at these sorts of things or the students who um, participated in these communication events, what did that mean for their overall performance in the, in the long run? So there's a lot more we need to do. There's a lot more functionality that we'd like to do. We're looking at building in some more social network analysis things. Again, Henrik showed you some of the, the SNAP tool before with all the little dots where you can see different patterns of people's engagement with one another in learning and teaching activities. So, but I think really as teachers, there's, there's some key things that we need to do when we're going to use learning analytics. Whether we've got a tool like the one I just showed you or whether you're just working with data yourself in your own offices outside of, um, of your teaching. And the idea here is, well, what is the problem or issue that you have with the particular lesson plan, with particular student behaviours, whatever it is. Um, and once you've identified that, what's the theory or the design? What did you want the students to do in that particular learning activity? Or is there a theory like self-regulated learning where you want to understand how the students are approaching their studies? Um, so what is the theory or the design that informs that situation? Then we can get to the all-important question. There's a lot of data out there, but what do we want to know? What are the questions that we have that we want the answers to? And sometimes the, uh, the big vendors of learning management systems will tell us the data that we, they're going to give us, but that data might not be the data that we need to answer the questions that we have. So we really need to think about what questions as teachers do we have for this data. And of course, once we know the questions, we can then identify the data that we need to answer those questions. And I think that's quite key. And as Henrik said, there's a lot of um, challenge there in bringing lots of different data sources together. And I think your schools and your, your universities need to spend a bit of time in working out data warehouses or, or whatever it is you're going to need to do those sorts of things. Once you've got the data, how do you represent it in a way that will be meaningful to teachers? 
So it's all really great to have this data, but if we give it to teachers and they just don't know what to do with it and how to make it turn it into actions, then we've sort of wasted our time a little bit. And of course, when do they need this data? Is it a continuous thing? Are there key points in time? And uh, you need to sort that out depending on what the questions are. So let's move from teachers to students. So when we were interviewing the teachers about this sort of thing, a lot of teachers said, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could use learning analytics to kind of automate the idea of giving feedback to students? And a whole bunch of other teachers said, well, I don't know about that, because will the students know what to do with it? Will they be capable of interpreting this data in a way that can improve their teaching and learn, uh, improve their learning? So we thought, okay, let's go and ask some students. Let's go and create a learning analytics scenario for, stu for students and see what they do. So for students, we wanted to know how they wanted this data to come to them. We wanted to know what data they were interested in seeing. And of course, we also wanted to know when. And again, as Henrik mentioned before, one of the really important things to consider around students and data is the idea of privacy and ethics. And that's something that we're, uh, we're continuing in our studies uh, at the moment, actually. So. In Korea, there was a really interesting study done a couple of years ago where they took data from the learning management system and they gave it to students. But the students, and they didn't give them any information about their performance or their assessment. All they did was give them information about how many times they'd logged into the learning management system and what sorts of things they were accessing in the learning management system. But then students started to get a bit concerned because as this student said, you know, I don't think that just what I do online is a good reflection of my general efforts in learning and teaching outcomes. So I think there's a little bit of concern here from students about how much emphasis we're putting on data from learning management systems when that may only represent a very small amount of what is their teaching and learning experience. But they said that there were some ways that learning analytics could be really useful to them in terms of planning their learning or managing their learning processes, uh, being able to set goals, set learning goals for themselves in particular subjects, but also more broadly in their degrees. And to sort of get an objective and accurate perspective, when we asked students about how they thought they were going, it was often quite different to how they were actually going. Um, but they really were quite cautious about all of this data about their engagement having some sort of impact on their final results. So there was a lot of concern there. And what we're seeing now is a lot of learning management systems coming out with these sorts of dashboards, graphs, tables, charts, and they're all sort of a one-size-fits-all, and they don't often take into consideration different ways that we teach, different learning designs, different learning tasks. So these are just three, a Blackboard one, uh, I think it's a Canvas one, and a Moodle one. So we can see lots of different ones. They've all got very similar graphs, charts, line charts, that kind of thing. So what we decided to do was we would design a dashboard to test this out with students. Now, I just have to say, we weren't trying to make a, da a perfect dashboard. Okay. And when you see it, you'll see it's not perfect. But what we really wanted to do was just to give, you, give the students the same sort of experience that they would have if they were using some of these vendor tools. And so we decided to start with the learning design, which I have to say is something that the vendors often don't do. Uh, what was it that the students were asked to do? What were the summative ses assessment items? What were the formative assessment items? What were the um, points of engagement that we could measure for the students over time? So, as I said, sorry, performance, summative and formative, and engagement. And unfortunately, in the ways that most people use their LMS, certainly at the University of Melbourne, there were limited points of engagement that we were able to measure because predominantly things still happen in the classroom. So LMS access, or how many pages they were accessing within the learning management system, was one of our only indicators that we could really pull out on a consistent basis across the courses in this study. As a very last minute decision, we decided to throw in the class average. Now this was probably the best and the worst decision that we made in this study. Uh, the class average gave the students a standard by which they could compare their own performance. But what we discovered later on was that it actually often obscured people's performance and distracted them from their overall goals. But I'll go back to that in a moment. So here's just one example of the, the dashboard that we use for biology. Now in biology, the, uh, the students, again, uh, they have face-to-face -face lectures, they have face-to-face -face laboratories, but they have to do a certain amount of um, 
preparation and summarization online. So they have a quiz before their labs each week and they have a quiz after their labs each week. Um, they also have a number of formative quizzes online, so optional things that they can do, and also a weekly online quiz uh, that about a key topic as well. So this is an unusual subject in the sense that it has more online than most of the other subjects that we have at the University of Melbourne. So anyway, what we discovered was that students were generally very happy with the dashboard. They just liked the fact they were getting some feedback. They saw it as being more than what they were getting at the moment. So generally, when we asked them to rate the usefulness of the dashboard, they were all fairly positive in terms of that. But when we looked at what they were doing with it, they found it really useful for reflection. So thinking about um, how they were approaching their studies, the choices they were making around their studies. And of course, we were looking at one particular subject. But of course, most students do four subjects in each semester. And it was really interesting to see, often they would say, oh, look, I could see I wasn't doing so well here, but I had an assessment due for another subject, so I had to put my emphasis there. And that's something that we often don't take into consideration when we're looking at learning analytics. Well, this student didn't do very well here. Yeah, but why? There might actually be a legitimate reason for why they didn't spend too much time or engage in a particular task. So the students had the opportunity to plan or amend study strategies in response to seeing this feedback. Um, and we often ask them why they said things. So people were like, oh, I think I'll, um, I'll log in more because I can see other people in my class are logging in more than I am. We said, okay, well, that's great, but what's that going to do? You know, what, what, what happens once you've logged in? What is it you do after that? Because I think that's going to be more important to your learning than just the, the actual um, act of logging in. Most of the students said that it increased their motivation. Being able to see more clearly how they were doing in their class increased their motivation to do better and to, to engage more. They say that it increased their motivation, but we studied them over a semester and we still saw a lot of them who dropped off. Uh, not, nobody failed, but certainly um, their motivation was high, but their performance and their engagement continued to be low or in some cases actually decreased as well. Comparing to the class average was really interesting. We saw a number of students at the beginning of semester and we said, what was your goal? And they said, we want to get a high distinction. And then as we showed them their dashboard throughout the semester, they sort of went, oh, wow, look, I'm doing just about the average or just above the average. Great. We thought, well, that's great if you want to be just above the average, but it's not going to get you a high distinction. So it became a little bit of a distractor from their ultimate goals. Um, what a lot of students liked was just this consolidated view, being able to see all the different elements of their course in one view, all the bits that they'd done, all the bits that they still had to do, in some cases, the bits that they'd missed, <laughs> okay? Um, but being able to sort of plan out a study strategy by seeing another kind of representation of the curriculum overall. But there was some interesting findings around making meaning of the data, being able to um, interpret the data, Obviously, the availability of data was low, so we had to deal with that. And different ways of visualising. So we found the science students were really good at working with certain visualisations, but the, uh, the Japanese students were not so great. The architects were OK in some ways and some not, not, not in other ways. So it was a bit discipline uh, dependent on how the students dealt with and uh, were able to interpret this data. So moving forward from this study, I mean, this wasn't to design an actual dashboard. We just wanted to get a sense of what students did with it. And in some ways, we're a little bit worried because students weren't able to interpret it very well. But in some ways, other students were able to interpret it really well. So the findings are a little bit mixed, and how we take that forward will be quite interesting. Um, but in the UK, there's some interesting studies being done by JISC, the Joint Information Systems Committee, um, where they've gone to students and asked them to design a dashboard or to design an app for learning analytics. And uh, so they've been working on these designs over the last few months, and it'll be really interesting because I think this project is still ongoing to see what they come up with um, ultimately. So really what we've been doing in these two studies is just a bit of, of the preliminary work, trying to understand the context, trying to understand academics or teachers' needs as well as students' needs. We have answered some of our questions. I think we've actually created more questions by trying to answer some of these questions. Um, but I hope that this work will help to sort of inform the, the future directions of some of the, uh, the developments around learning analytics. It's a very hot topic and thing to do at the moment to go out and build a new learning 
learning analytics tool, um, which I know that we did. But you know, I think that, uh, that there's a lot of scope there, but I think that there's a lot we need to understand before we can go too much further. Like Charles was saying around building learning management systems, we need to understand how they'll work in practice. So we've got a couple of uh, future um, projects that we're looking at at the moment as well. So one of the things that was really clear coming out of the student project was that students have a very mixed understanding of what feedback is. So we're really interested in how we can use learning analytics to improve feedback to students. But what we really want to know now, or what, what my team is looking at in particular, is sort of going right back to that core concept of what feedback is and what students think feedback is, and what kinds of feedback they want at what times in semester. So how do we personalise that feedback? And what we want to do is look at it over time so that we can get a sense of not just what do they need right now, but what do they need uh, over a particular semester or degree. The other one is to look a little bit more into the ethics and privacy around this, and we're doing this with two other institutions, uh, the University of New South Wales and the University of New England. So I'll finish there, but um, please, if you'd like to see that tool, it was open source, so it will be available to anybody in Estonia if you'd like to use it in the future, um, but please come and talk to me afterwards if you've got any further questions about either of those two studies. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Mort Landberg from Tallinn University. Hi. Uh, uh, where did you keep this data Do you, you, you used for, for creating this uh, nice dashboards? Did, mm. did you use some open source learning record store? Or? Good question. I knew you'd ask a technical one. Um, for the student dashboard, uh, we didn't actually store the data anywhere in particular because it wasn't a live dashboard. Um, but for the teacher's dashboard, um, we have it on a, a separate server that's hosted at the University of South Australia. Um, so we don't have a, a separate system for it. So the idea of it being an open source um, software is that any institution could um, take that particular piece of technology and put it in with whatever data stores they already have in their institution, and it should work. There should be a, um, a data export between the two. So it's, it's the one part of the project that isn't complete in terms of, the, uh, of being able to migrate the data in between, but we did, did it on a temporary basis in order to, to pilot the tool. So, so it's, it's only a half answer to your question, sorry. <laughs> are you able to incorporate also data from I don't know, social media the students are using? Uh, because some students yeah. must use blogs or something for, for uh, yeah. accompanying their, their, their normal learning environment. Absolutely. The way that the tool was set up, so we, we were very conscious of that, and just because of the budget and the timeline for the project, we only focused on data from the learning management system. Um, but we've built it in a way such that other data sources can be plugged in. So we were very conscious about the number of people who use tools like Turnitin, and uh, different types of social media tools and things like that. So we're hoping that um, it's, it's basically extensible to any other kinds of services that you might want to add in. And again, it's something that the institution, when they implement the tool, can make that decision about what they pull into the tool or not. Yeah. Thank okay. you. I think we've got another question there. So. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Henrik, you want to ask something? <laughs> Thanks, Linda, for... Um, I have a question for your learning design. What um, I mean, we were also thinking about. I mean, we invented IMSL learning design a few years ago, and we haven't didn't yeah. do a lot there in the in the recent years. So, but it, I find it also difficult. We thought about it, and I mean, there's so many learning designs. You can do flip the classroom. You mm. can do whatever. Yeah. So, how you address with your general framework? all these different flavors of creative education that it should be and don't make it boring at the end. Huh? Exactly. You, 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 yeah. you know what I mean? So yep. how you address that with learning analytics? One of the things that I didn't show you today is a, another part of the tool, which is called the pedagogical helper tool. And it goes with the, the learning analytics tool that I showed you. And it's trying to get academics to think about 
their designs. So the designs could be anything, as you say. There are so many different designs. Um, but really, all we want them to do is to think about what context that design provides to the interpretation of the data. So you could show the same data in the same way with the same representations. But depending on the design of the, the learning task, there are many different ways you could interpret that. So what we're trying to do in our tool is just to get people to think about that. We've realized that it will be impossible to try and sort of build the learning design into the tool in a very integrated way, but certainly just making the, the teachers more aware of it, even though that they are aware of it, but I think sometimes more subconsciously, they've designed the activity, they've probably run it year after year, and they often don't think about, okay, well, what is it I'm asking the students to do? Why am I asking them to do it? And what kind of data will help me to work out if that's working or not? Yeah. Thinking about Anna Willems from uh, University of Tartu. Uh, thinking about students and teachers being able or not being able to use analytical data, have you tried uh, to train them? It means to organize some courses yeah. for students. What kind of information can you get or teachers? Um, no, professional development is something that we have. Um, we've got a three key structure at the University of Melbourne about learning analytics and professional development is the third um, key in that structure. But unfortunately, we haven't done much of it yet because there's still not a lot of tools available to academics. So it's sort of a bit of a chicken and an egg situation. We want to, uh, we, <laughs> we want to uh, give teachers the tools to be able to do this and we want to train them how to use it, but we can't train them how to use it until the tools are there. So we're at the moment looking at ways that we can teach them about the things they can do themselves, but we will ramp up that professional development over time, and I think that's my time. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>